Hello, hi everyone. Welcome back to Wu Can Cook. My name is Wesley, and this is a show where we are slowly cooking our way through all of the food from my childhood. Today, we're diving back into our series dedicated to Japanese classics with a shot at a katsu or sometimes tonkatsu curry. For those unfamiliar, a katsu curry consists of a savory, slow simmered Japanese curry with potatoes and carrots, then topped with, you guessed it, a breaded and fried pork cutlet known as tonkatsu. Now, those following along with this channel may recognize that we have independently done multiple versions now of both Japanese curry as well as a fried katsu cutlet. Some may recall the white miso curry that we did a while back, as well as the chicken katsu and pork tonkatsu cutlets that we did more recently as well. So, this means that we'll be more than a little familiar with how to cook each of the elements in our dish today, which is great because I love making things that I know how to cook, because it's way less stressful, y'all. In any case, a Japanese curry, as you might imagine, leans heavily on the use of curry powder, which, since it is a spice blend, leaves a whole bunch of room for fluidity because every curry powder blend is a little bit different. So, we'll be diving into a few supplemental spices that I like to add to mine for my personal tastes. Then, of course, for our tonkatsu pork cutlets, we've got these gorgeous pork cutlets courtesy of Taylor's Sausage in Oakland, as well as a closer look into how to properly use panko breadcrumbs so that it doesn't immediately fall off in the fryer, which, let's face it, we've all been there, right? Okay, so let's get into it. Alright, so diving right in, we're starting things off here first with the aromatic veggies of our curry today, which we'll be more or less borrowing from our white miso curry from a few months back. This is four cloves of crushed and minced garlic to start, followed by one inch or about one tablespoon of fine minced ginger, and the whites of three green onions sliced up thinly. Then I've got these reserved greens of our green onions, which we're slicing up thinly on a bias as well, and setting aside to use raw as our final finishing garnish. Moving right along with our veggies here, this is one half of a sweet white onion, which I'm large dicing with the root end still attached, so that it may hold the onion together as we slice. You may notice as we move along here that this onion is the single most delicate ingredient in our entire curry today, so we'll be adding it into the curry very late to make sure that it doesn't completely disappear into the simmer. Next up are my russet potatoes, about three or four depending on how large your spuds are. I'm peeling these, then slicing into halves, and trimming off the tapered end before large dicing as well. The tapered end of a russet potato almost always overcooks because of its awkwardly small shape, particularly when fried, like with home fries for example. Personally, I've never been a huge fan of trimming because it's very wasteful, but I do think that it actually makes a pretty big difference with russets since they're so uneven. Next up, rounding out our veggies today is our second and final root veggie, which is going to be some carrots. We're again trimming off their tip and tail ends before peeling, then sorting by size before slicing up. Just as with our russets, since carrots have such a dramatic taper to their shape, I find that sorting these by size helps me get to a more evenly sized dice as I work. Moving on to the sauce element of our curry next, this along with our dried curry powder of course would be the elements that you more frequently would find dried and cubed when you buy pre-mixed boxed roux at the grocery stores. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these, I know that when I was a kid I grew up eating the SMB golden curry roux, but as with anything that's pre-mixed, I love taking the opportunity to break these things down whenever possible since it gives us more control over what we're actually putting into the dish. So, going in here first, this is 4 tablespoons of soy sauce to start, followed next by 2 tablespoons of Japanese rice mirin and 2 tablespoons of Japanese sake. Then next for our big bold umami drivers, this is a single tablespoon each of oyster sauce and white miso paste going in, which we're mixing to combine. Finally, last up in a separate bowl, I'm mixing up a quick cornstarch slurry comprised of 2 tablespoons of cornstarch dissolved in water, then we're moving on to our pork cutlets next. Okay, so diving into our tonkatsu, we're starting off with some prep work to our cutlets, mainly in an effort to prevent the cutlet from curling up as it fries. 
You can think of it sort of like how bacon shrivels up in the pan. This is the result of the fat beginning to render into liquid form as it is introduced to heat. So we're starting by trimming off the extra fat from our cutlets here first, then lightly scoring them against the grain on either side, also to help us keep our cutlets from curling as they fry. Then moving right along, I'm setting up a three-part breading station so that we may coat our cutlets in panko. Here in my first bowl are two eggs that I'm whisking to combine, followed by a half cup of AP flour in my second bowl, and a single cup of panko breadcrumb in my third bowl. Then next, here's my cutlets getting a toss in the flour first, followed by my eggs second, and finally our panko coating for our third and final coating. We're taking an extra moment to make sure and press very firmly onto our panko here, which should help us make sure that as much of it as possible will adhere to our cutlet as it fries. Next up over on the stove, we're setting our prepped cutlets aside for a moment and switching gears back to our curry element. I have my wok heating up as hot as possible, then I'm adding 4 tablespoons of peanut oil and as always, long yao for that nice non-stick surface. Then going in first are my aromatic veggies. This is my garlic, ginger, and what should have been the whites of my green onions, which somehow I forgot to add here, but we'll get back to those in a moment. I'm tossing this all for 15 seconds until nice and fragrant, then following up with my potatoes and carrots next. We're doing one more quick toss to combine, then adding in our sauce element plus about a half cup of water to help get our simmer going. Next up, here's my dry spices going in, which for those keeping track would be the other half of the elements that would be pre-built into those boxed roux that we all know and love. This is two tablespoons of curry powder here to start. Then next, as I mentioned earlier, I like to supplement my curry powder with a few additional elements, most of which are already mixed into the spice blend, but I do find helps bring the blend to life a little bit. This is a half teaspoon each of turmeric and cumin going in first, followed by what I think will be the only ingredient that is absolutely going to trigger curry purists all over the internet, but this is a half teaspoon of garam masala. <sighs> I know, calm down, it's gonna be okay. Garam masala is a spice blend of Indian origin and absolutely does not belong in a traditional Japanese curry, but the primary ingredients in it are coriander, cardamom, cinnamon, clove, and nutmeg, which by the way is very similar to a Chinese five spice and is going to give us just that tiny bit of nutty and warm quality that we need for our slow simmer coming up. Okay, so now that we've all calmed down a bit and revised our rage comments, I'm letting this all slow simmer over medium low heat for a minimum of 30 minutes or ideally two to three hours if you have the patience, adding additional water as needed. Once our curry is at about 10 minutes before you plan on ending your simmer, we're finally adding in our onions, then setting aside on the side burner while we circle back to our tonkatsu next. I have my fryer heating up at 350 degrees F, then I'm adding in my cutlets one at a time and frying for two to three minutes before flipping and frying for an additional two to three minutes until golden brown. As we pull these out and set them aside on a dry rack, you may note how nicely even and flat our cutlets are here thanks to all of that prep work that we did earlier. Back over on the stove, we're circling back to our curry next, which is now fully reduced and ready to be shoveled into my gut mouth. Here's those whites of my green onions going in, which again I profusely apologize for not adding in earlier. Then finally, I'm seasoning this all to taste with some kosher salt. As with anything that's going to be simmering and reducing, always remember to add your salt and seasonings at the very end because you won't have an accurate read on the dish's salinity until it's fully reduced. Last up, here's my cornstarch slurry going in to thicken things up. Then back over on the cutting board, I'm slicing up my tonkatsu here into strips first. Then I'm serving my curry with a side of rice to start, topped with my tonkatsu and the greens of my green onions, and we're ready to eat. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, those following along with this channel may very likely know that the Japanese curry is one of my absolute favorite dishes to make pretty much any chance that I get. Not only do we have a couple of different iterations of this curry up on the channel now, but it also made a pretty regular appearance in our live streams back when the pandemic was in full swing too. Y'all remember that? In any case, while the tonkatsu pork cutlet may seem like a wildly simple addition, and to be fair, it is, I actually think that the addition of the pork cutlet pretty dramatically changes the nature of the dish as a whole. 
the crisp and crunchy qualities to our tonkatsu makes for an excellent textural contrast to the slow simmered root veggies in our curry, which are otherwise pretty softened up from the simmer. And while it is true that our breading and batter didn't take on much independent seasoning for itself, I think its combination with the rich and umami driven curry makes for the absolute perfect bite in both texture and flavor. Finally, the last bit that I'll mention is that I know it's small, but the addition of that extra garam masala really helps tie this whole dish together, sort of like a shake of nutmeg in a pasta bolognese. So, I don't know. I guess you can commence your rage comments now, but, you know, just try it first. Okay, so that's it everyone. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you give this one a shot. For those who are new to the channel, this one is part of a larger series that's dedicated to Japanese classic dishes, so definitely check out that series next if you haven't yet because there's a lot of these. For the Bay Area locals, the Wu Can Cook Fried Rice Pop-Up is now at Wonder Brewing in Emeryville every Thursday through Sunday, so come by and say hi then if you can. More about that at wukancook.com slash eats. Also a fun update, we've got t-shirts. I'm super excited to be partnering with my good friends at Polywalk Prints to make these super sweet Wu Can Cook t-shirts. They're super soft and comfortable and also have a picture of me on the back, which is crazy. We're selling these at the Wu Can Cook pop-up at Wonder Brewing, or you can head over to wukancook.com slash shop to grab one of these from the online store too. As always, like, comment, subscribe, share, be nice interneters, and I'll see you soon.